What's up guys? There is a new movie out called Us, and it references the verse Jeremiah 11:11. 11, 11. It reads, "Therefore, this is what the Lord says: I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them." That is a crazy verse. Let's unpack it. What's up guys, I make videos just like this every single week to make faithful followers of Jesus and equip them to change the world. If that sounds like what you're looking for, do me a favor and slap that subscribe button, go ahead and tap that notification bell, be sure to follow, leave a comment, do all the cool YouTube things. All right, so there's a new horror movie out called Us. And in the movie, it references this verse, Jeremiah 11, 11, which at an initial reading seems to speak of God in a very angry, hateful sense. And when we think of God, if you know the least little thing about God, that's not how you think of him. So the question is, what is up with this verse? Why is God saying what he's saying? Why is he going to bring destruction on a people? Why is he going to not answer prayers? What could cause God to act like that? So this particular scripture is given to a specific people at a specific time for a specific reason. And that there is actually a lot of background to what God says here. So I will say like any other passage of scripture, any other single verse, never read just a single verse and, and assume you know what it means. We always have to read scripture in context. So anytime we see a verse like this one where God is talking about destruction and not answering prayers and doing the things that we think God shouldn't do, we need to look at it in its whole. We need to look at it in context. So that's exactly what we're going to do here with Jeremiah 11, 11 is we're going to look at the context of this passage. So the best way to do this is simply start at the beginning of the chapter. It's best if you read the whole book, but if you don't have that kind of time, start at the beginning of the chapter. So let's read in Jeremiah 11, starting in verse 2. Listen to the terms of this covenant and tell them to the people of Judah and to those who live in Jerusalem. Tell them that this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Cursed is the one who does not obey the terms of this covenant. The terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace, I said, obey me and do everything I command you and you will be my people and I will be your God. So at the very start, God is talking about this covenant that he made with Moses, that he made with the Israelites very early on. And this covenant was a promise. Now, when we hear the word covenant, it sounds very biblical, very ancient, but really what we're talking about is, is a, a contract. A, a written legal document, something that binds two parties together. So when we're talking about a covenant, God is talking about his contract that he had with Israel. And it was this, that if Israel would obey him, that they would follow his commands, that they would keep their end of the bargain, that they would be God's people and that he would be their God. So when we get to this verse and it says God hears them but doesn't answer their calling, is that so wrong? They broke their contract, right? They broke the contract. They, they made the contract null and void. So once the contract was broken, are they still God's people? Because they disobeyed God. You see, what the Israelites, what the people of Judah were doing at this moment is they were, they were creating and they were worshiping other gods above Yahweh, the God of Israel. That they were worshiping Baal and they were worshiping these other gods and they worshiped monuments and they created their own gods with their own hands and they would lean and they would pray to and they would give glory to these other gods. And, and God, Yahweh, the God of Israel says, you know what, I'm fed up with it. I'm done. You want your other gods, you can keep your other gods. Because in the very next verse, in verse 12, Yahweh actually says this, Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry to the gods to whom they make offerings, but they cannot save them in the time of their trouble. Why does God say this? Because he knows that the gods that they are crying out to, the gods that they are worshiping, the gods they are giving glory to are false gods. They do not exist. They have been created with human hands and cannot answer prayers. You see, when we put things above God, sometimes God is going to give us the things we put above him. And he's going to say, you know what? Go ahead. Cry out to that thing. See if it will save you. It never will. The more things we try to take in and to fill that void, it will never fill that void. You see, we may think that God... This is unfair. Why are you treating your people like this? Because God had a plan. He left them to their own volitions. He left them to their own created gods. And he said, okay, do it yourself. But he didn't stop there. 
He had a plan. He knew from the beginning what he was going to do. He knew that he wasn't going to leave them forever, but he was just going to let them see that their gods were nothing but false gods. In just a few short chapters, Yahweh is going to utter a phrase that will become the most popular Bible verse in history, and that's Jeremiah 29 11. He's speaking to these exact same people, these people that, that disobeyed him, that denied him, that blasphemed him, then chose other gods above him. God says to them, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. You see, Yahweh, the one true living God, is greater than all other ideas and all other creations and all other deities that people created with their own mind because he is filled with love and he is filled with grace in the midst of absolute betrayal. God loves each and every person. Yes, he says, for this moment, I may not answer you. For this moment, I may cause destruction so that you can see the sort of destruction you're causing into your own life. Yes, for this moment. But listen, I have a plan and I love you and I have a great, glorious, grace-filled plan for your future. Though they betrayed him, Though they denied him, though they created gods that they would love more than him, God is filled so much with love and grace that he still had a plan and a purpose and he loved them and he did not leave them nor did he reject them, but he called them back to himself. We see these same plans that he mentions. We see them come to fruition in the New Testament. Read in Hebrews 9.15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Christ came to set us all free of the sins committed under the first covenant. The first covenant that these Israelites broke and that God said that I will bring destruction on you and I will not hear your words. God sent Jesus, his very own son from heaven to live a perfect sinless life so that he could go to the cross and he could forgive the sins committed under that first covenant. Yes, though we broke that first covenant, though the Israelites broke and betrayed and denied God in that first covenant, God loved them so much that he sent his beloved son to die on the cross to save them from their sins. You see, we can read Jeremiah 11, 11, and we can see that God is a hate-filled, frustrated father God, and that he just wants to cause destruction on his people. And when you pray, he does not hear your words. You see, that's what happens when we take scripture out of context. We don't get the true identity of who God really is. You see, God in this moment, yes, he had to show discipline to his children the same as a father must show discipline to his children because he knows what is good for them. We may not like that aspect of God, but we need that aspect of God as much as we need the grace-filled Savior. Sometimes we need discipline. We need to be shown our wrongs so that we can see our rights. So Jeremiah 11, 11 was not a eternal punishment. It was a, a guiding, it was a direction to show them where they were to go and that God would use this moment, that he still had a plan and that he would still send his savior, the son of God would come and to pay for sin and death and that he would cover all the sins and the betrayals and the denials and the brokenness that was made underneath the first covenant, that he had a plan and a purpose for the good and future of the Israelites. So yeah, Jeremiah 11, 11 may sound negative, but God had a great plan through it. I hope that if you had any questions about this, if you were concerned about God's character, this sort of cleared it up. All of scripture is connected. We have multiple books and multiple chapters and multiple verses. They're all written by followers of God, by inspiration of the one true God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. So when you put them all together, you get the full context and the full identity of who God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who they are. Hope that it cleared up anything you had. If you enjoyed this video, I make videos just like this, hopefully to encourage and to educate you. If you enjoyed that, do me a favor and go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Leave me a comment down below to give me your take on this scripture, what you took away from this, if this helped you, if it kind of opened up some understanding for you. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching. Love you. Keep living that bold life.